Conversations. Can I get you guys to grab a seat, please? Grab a beer and grab a seat. That would be awesome. We've got some amazing presentations tonight. There are a lot of seats on this side of the room. People who don't yet have friends, please come this way. Nobody bites. Or they need more friends. I'm sure we all have friends. All right, I am Allie Merritt. I'm your MC for the night. Thank you all for joining me on this very rainy Monday. I know that that makes Atlanta traffic super fun for everybody. But we have a really fantastic lineup. Startup Village is the largest monthly meeting of entrepreneurs in the Southeast. If you have not followed us, that's right, Sherry knows what's going on. If you have not followed us on the meetup, you should. There are 14,000 people on there, so that is 14,000 people you should be connected to in the area. I know, right? Like you're in good company. So, if you want to follow the conversation tonight, hashtag ATLSV, we have a Twitter, we have an Instagram, people like to put us in their stories, that's cool too. Whatever you want to do, we like it. So, we have a little bit of housekeeping to go through tonight, and then we've got four presenters. They do five minutes each. Normally, we have five presenters, but we had somebody back out, which is also why you should always come prepared to start our village, because you never know when I might put you in at the last minute if you really want to go. I'm not making that up. I want to put somebody in on four minutes' notice. So, if you have a pitch, and you're like, oh, hey, it looks like we only have a few people, come talk to me next time. Okay. So first of all, we are live streaming. We record it, which is really fun for people like me who fall over a lot. You get to watch it later. But this is done for free because of our fantastic team at PullSpark. So if you guys will all turn around and wave and give me a hi, PullSpark. Yes, thank you. Now you're all on their social media. Congratulations. They do this for free for us every single month because they are wonderful and amazing people. We also have a really fantastic team of sponsors. So you guys all have free beer because we have two amazing sponsors. You have a space to sit in because we have a fantastic space sponsor. And you also have chairs to sit on because we have volunteers. So everybody gets to give a little speech. If you want to be a volunteer, come talk to me after as well and I'll point you in the right direction. So first of all, we are in this space because of the amazing people at Atlanta Tech Village. So let's give a warm round of applause for Kelly Ann. Hello everybody, I'm Kelly and I'm the Director of Programming here at Atlanta Tech Village. How many of y'all are new to Startup Village? Welcome, we're so glad you're here um, and happy to have you at the Atlanta Tech Village. So we're the fourth largest startup hub in the nation. We have over 300 startups in our building with over a thousand members. So it's super exciting and it makes our job, I think, the best job in the world. Sorry everyone else, all of you who have jobs. Um, <laughs> But like I said, we're excited to have you here. If you are an entrepreneur and you have a technology startup, so you have proprietary technology, we want the village to be your home. Um, if you don't know what that looks like or you have questions about that, and if, and if you do know what that looks like and you want to talk about it more, we're at the back at the sound booth tonight. So come chat with us and learn how you can become a villager. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Please wait till after to go back and chat with them, but they will be back there afterwards. All right, you are drinking beer because we have two amazing beer sponsors, so let's give a round of applause for Headway. Come on up, ladies. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This evening, uh, we, by the way, have sweet water. Oh, my bad. Sorry. I'm not used to inseeing. Sweet water over there and Tropicalia from uh, Johnny on the Spot. We're enjoying serving you guys this evening. But uh, we're from Headway. I'm one of the uh, owner founders. And we offer a recruiting, accounting, finance, and operations back office as a service organization. Meaning you can either take part in our accounting finance services, office management, operations, or recruiting or a whole bundle feature. Now, what we specialize in is we don't only just offer those services, but we also target startups, small companies to help you be prepared for a successful exit. Stay away from those landmines that are out there. Notice that uh, we need to get your accounting systems and make sure your compliance is in order to make sure you can raise funds or have a successful exit. 
In that, we also do a flat fee model, so no hourly fees. You can budget for that, you can forecast for that, no, no secrets, and we're very transparent. And our goal is to partner with you and grow with you, okay? So we don't wanna just give you a service and walk away. We want to provide you with not only a service, but a partner. Because if you grow, we grow, and let's, let's get this thing to the finish line. So uh, my partner here, Tara, is also ahead of our recruiting, and she'll share a little bit about our recruiting platform, which is a little different from your traditional. So once again, welcome this evening, drink up the beer, enjoy, and thank you so much. Hey guys. So biggest commodity in any business, and definitely a startup business, is obviously the people, right? Uh, you need the people to also build a product. Uh, we offer a model that grow with you from infancy to exit. Uh, essentially, our basic uh, basic uh, uh, fees start at about a thousand dollars a month for two, up to two hires. So you can essentially build your team from 20 to 24 people in one year with a model that's starting at base. Now that's only for people that are salaries under 100K. Uh, obviously, heads of engineering and VPs are gonna be a little bit more, but we also customize it to where you are in your business. So we hope you use us. One last plug for the accounting finance. Can you see which side I'm on? But no, all, all kidding aside, we do offer from your basic bookkeeping all the way to fractional CFO. And we've built a team, all of us are entrepreneurs ourselves, and also we have been in the startup community. Myself, I've been with uh, Luma, had a wonderful run with them, and uh, Rubicon Global, don't know if you know about them, but it's a, thank you, it's an Atlanta unicorn, and uh, I was there for four years of that, and then kind of got bored. I needed more of a startup community, so I left my investment safe. But that being said, we, we've really made a, a, an effort to build a team of people that have, we have the battle, the battle scars, the scar tissue, to, to help you grow, okay? So it's not just debits and credits or just throwing people in seats. We know what it takes, the special recipe to get you to the finish line. So we look forward to hopefully hearing from all of you and we'd love to partner with you and uh, build a relationship. So thank you very much. As she mentioned, the beer is sponsored by another fantastic sponsor. So give a warm round of applause for Johnny on it. Thanks. We're actually Johnny on it, not Johnny on the spot. All right, giving away 100 bucks. Take out your app, take out your phones, and download the, the first 10 people who download and create an account on our free mobile app. Wins $10 each. He's not making it up. Not making it up. Dollar dollar bowls, y'all. <laughs> All right, so we're Johnny on it. We connect homeowners like you to the service industry in real time. So if you need a plumber because of a cracked pipe, HVAC professional because it's hot, or your lights are flickering and need an electrician, well, you can download our app and get connected to service professionals that are trusted in less than 15 minutes. Our personalized experience connects you to service professionals that are licensed and insured in less than five clicks you can get connected to a resource to help you repair and improve and maintain your house. Thank you. How many people just downloaded the app? Raise your hand, because if I don't have 10, then some people are missing out. You gotta download the app, create the account, and he is actually gonna give you $10, I'm not making that up. They can actually see it. I asked him, I was like, how do you know? Because people are super honest. Uh, but he says that they, they actually know in the app, so. All right. We have now gone through a fair amount of the housekeeping, but again, you guys are sitting on chairs courtesy of our volunteers. If you want to volunteer, the only thing you have to do is show up, set up and take down chairs. That's it. So come see me or come see Hilton. Hilton, please wave for us in the back. Hilton manages all our volunteers, so please come see her after. So first volunteer for tonight, Alex Merritt. Round of applause, y'all. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. I am on the board of directors for the DeKalb Volunteer Lawyers Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization that provides free legal services to low-income DeKalb County residents. We, serve, we have served over 12,000 residents over the last 37 years. The majority of the people that we represent are women who are in abusive relationships and they are trying to get out. 
and they need our free legal services to do things like file for child support, child custody, uh, divorce, temporary protective orders. And I am here tonight because we need your support. Uh, we need your donations. And so I have the information in the back on the whiteboard. I'm asking each and every one of you to please donate just $10 tonight to help us continue to serve a community of people who so desperately needs our services. Uh, thank you very much. Come talk to me later tonight and have a great evening. And because Sherry was so very supportive earlier, give our last round for applause. Sherry, that's where you clap. Good evening, I'm Sherry Heil. My company is Amplified Concept. On the back it says Get Amplified. So that's for both freelancers and companies looking to hire freelancers. We are a freelancer collaborative. We have 100 members right now. What we do, uh, focused on marketing. So what we do is we basically create an agency on demand for our clients. So you only pay for the skill set you need um, within the industry. We've gotten very niche with industries. Um, and um, it's basically half the price of an agency. So if you need a web developer, a SEO person, a content person, and a social media person, we'll put that team together for you. You have one invoice and one project manager, so you're not managing a whole bunch of people, and it's about the half the price of an agency. So it's Amplified Concepts. If you're a freelancer, I'd love to have you talk to you about being a member, and if you're looking to hire freelancers, whether it's one or a team of freelancers, come talk to me and get Amplified. All right, we have done all the housekeeping, which means who is excited to see some startup pitches? Fantastic. Are we ready to go? Okay. Our very first presenter, I don't have a screen yet. I could do a tap dance, nobody probably really wants that. Okay, so if you would like to present next month or the month after, please come see me after as well. We just ask that you be Atlanta-based, that you are a startup, and that you have something that you can pitch or present in four minutes or so. Okay, all right, see, that was the tap dance. Okay, round of applause for iAccess Life. Good evening, and I appreciate everybody coming out and everybody that's tuning in. Hey, Mom, hey, Dad, hey, hey Devin. <laughs> Uh, my name is Brandon Winfield, and I'm the CEO and founder of iAccess Life. My journey starts about 12 years ago when I was injured in a motocross accident at 14 years old. Um, this was a pretty tumultuous time for somebody who's in high school and still figuring out themselves and who they are. And it's quite a big transition. Um, luckily for me, I knew the risk of what I was doing, and that allowed me to adjust to my new lifestyle relatively easily. I just saw it as another broken bone and how I'm going to cope and what we're going to do next. Um, Unfortunately, for other people, they don't really have this, uh, this kind of thing to get out of it. Some people are in the wrong place at the wrong time, or they're doing something they shouldn't do. And I got to meet a lot of those people at the Shepherd Center while I was there doing my rehabilitation. Um, these people are having a hard time adjusting to life, and it's a demographic we often forget about until we end up in it. Um, I bet a lot of you didn't know that globally, 15% of the world, which is nearly 1 billion people, suffer from some sort of disability. 53 million of those people happen to be in the U.S. Right now, we only cater to those with physical impairments, but we look to expand to everything else as far as hearing, seeing, autism, and all those other disabilities, and we can't wait to cater them. So, as a whole, we spend about $200 billion annually on travel, oh, $20 billion on travel, and we have discretionary spend of $200 billion. The two, 20 billion in annual travel is actually doubled because we tend to travel with companions and friends. So that being said, we tend to be a catalyst for many innovations and we are a great diversity in the workplace. So through my travels, I started to notice a lack of accessibility from place to place. Um, I'm not gonna say what age I was, maybe 18, 19, but while we were traveling to bars and doing fun things as you know teenagers do, I started to notice that I couldn't get in the bathroom at some places I went to. Um, I hated being a burden, and I hated having to call the night early just because I had an accident and I couldn't get into the bathroom. So instead of being a complainer or somebody to cause a scene, I decided to develop a solution. Introducing iAccess Life. iAccess Life is a mobile application that allows those with physical impairments to rate and review locations based on their accessibility. I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a quick little demonstration. 
the switch transition. Back. Can everybody see this yet? Are you plugged in? No? Nothing? Yeah. Oh, there we go. All right, we're back. There we go. So I'm going to be facing this way a little bit. It's hard to use both hands and turn. So we'll log on to the iAccess Live. I'm already signed up. It would take a little bit. I have to start from scratch. And since we're at Atlanta Tech Village currently, we will pull them up and we will rate you guys. So one of our features, you can actually favorite a location that you like and that'll show up in your favorite screen. I don't have, I mean, you have those already. All right, so the entrance here, there's no handicap accessible button on the door, but the doors are light and easy to access. So we'll give you guys a four star. Your bathroom, let's talk about your bathroom real quick. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have one accessible handicap stall and it's very tight and hard to squeeze into. But nonetheless, you guys have accommodated, so we'll give you guys a three star. Your parking, your parking deck's amazing. We don't get rained on, tons of accessible spaces. Give you guys a five star on that one. And interior, been very impressed with that so far, so we'll give you guys a five star. I'll leave out this uh, right review because we're starting to run low on time. So we'll submit that, and we will transition back over to the pitch deck. I got my, oh, no, we're not back. Okay, I'm gonna keep talking. So <laughs> we launched in April of 2019, and we have acquired nearly 1,000 users already. Um, <laughs> thank you. 42% uh, of these users are monthly users, 17% are weekly users, and together they have amassed over 2,500 unique locations rated and reviewed. Um, this has taken place in over 40 states and 20 countries. Our three-year projection between our mobile application and the web application that we are gonna be launching at the end of this year, we see us having about 120,000 users at that stage. So, so far we've raised $115,000 and this has allowed us to do our application development and our MVP. Um, it's been the source of our initial user acquisition and we are currently seeking $500,000 to continue upon our future feature development as well as our user acquisition and legal expenses and everything else that comes with crafting a successful startup. We have a great team that you guys can ask about. We go to Q&A, Saeed, my co-founder, five years of experience, software product uh, owner, as well as a Georgia Tech graduate. Brad Lurie, Steve Roseboom, our initial investors and angel advisors, or initial angel investors and our advisors. Mujib Khan, who we just brought on, 25 years of brand and marketing strategy, 15 of those at Coca-Cola. Thank you. Questions? Yes. What's your measured asking price per user? Is it based on reviews or is it measured on logins and downloads? So she asked, um, how are we measuring our active users? Are they based on reviews or um, sign ons? Our active users, we have an analytics page where they come, where we can go and see how many people have signed on that day for the last seven days uh, for the month and things like that. So these are people that have come to the app, logged in and been on the app actively, um, rating or reviewing things. I'll, I'll add to that real quick. We have event triggers that happen when people save reviews, um, log in, sign up, all those different conversion events we were tracking through Firebase. Yes. So currently, right now, oh, the business model, thank you. <laughs> I had to repeat the question. So he's asking what our business model is at this point. So currently, we are at the point where we're just doing rate and reviews, it's our MVP. We'd really love to expand into the event space and become more of a lifestyle app where people can book accessible tickets, um, accommodations for hotels and um, sporting events, as well as you know, book an Uber, because they're doing their wheelchair accessible vehicle rollout currently. So we're really excited about that. And so our business model is gonna be implementing all these affiliate partnerships with these people. And we don't think that we should charge for this application. We think all this information should be free. 
So currently that'll be our business model as well as we have, as you saw, well, that was actually just lacking, but we can also do premium locations on our application. So if we like what you guys are doing, we partner with you guys, you pay a monthly fee, you can show up at the top of search results for what people are searching for. Yes. So she asked, does the app allow you to measure was it again? Well, the, the cities and neighborhoods and stuff like that for accessibility? Um, not really. Currently, we are just pulling from Google's API. So anything that shows up in Google's API, you can search and start rating for. Um, we would love to expand to that space, though, because there's so many things that need to be accessible as far as curb cutouts, um, apartment buildings, condos, things of the such. I'll add to that real quick. Technically, you can rate cities. Anything that comes back as a result from the Google API will have its own profile page that you could leave a rating for. Yes. So his question was, do we have any direct competitors in this space currently? And if they do show up, what are we gonna do to differentiate from what they're doing? As of right now, we have some competitors, not so much so in the application space. There's a website called Bread Approved where you can go on there and rate and review locations, but they are just website, web app only. Um, so what we're doing, and there's been some mobile apps out there as well, but they're very outdated, haven't been updated in years, and all they do is rate and review. It's, I mean, it's what we're doing currently, but our user experience is way better. Um, <laughs> we will also be adding in, like I said earlier, the social feed and event feed for people to find stuff to do in their area, as well as accessible sports for them to, to participate in. Um, we look forward to partnering with people such as Open Table, so you can book reservations, uh, Ticketmaster, and things like that. So we'll just be more than a rate and review app. We'll be an all-around lifestyle app to accommodate fun and stress-free adventures. Yeah, we want to leverage a bunch of scalable APIs to do things like he said, book a accessible open table reservation or book a Uber, WAV, wheelchair accessible vehicle, things like that as those programs come to nationwide fruition. Yes. So our plan for growth, you want to touch on that real quick? Oh, okay. So yeah, our plan for growth. I'll let Saeed touch on that one real quick. All right, I have 10 seconds, so I'll do this super fast. Uh, we just want to target different things like uh, social media advertising, influencers, uh, partner with organizations that help in this space so that they can help us get this into a bunch of users' hands and we can collect that really valuable database of information that'll make this amazing for everyone to use. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. So the in-between part is where I get to give things away. I tried kind of lottery tickets last month. You guys weren't real into that, so that's okay. So there are three chairs in here that have a pink sticky note under them. Check your chair, and whoever is number one gets the first prize. We're going to make this real simple. Who has pink sticky Is it number one? Yeah. All right. This nice gentleman is the winner of a fantastic... Johnny on it t-shirt, and you get a second shirt to give away to your nearest and dearest on your seats. Congratulations. Now, if you have number two or number three, hold on to those because those will be in between the next couple of rounds. Also, ah, I have been told that we have the 10 names of people who have won money. Who is interested in getting their $10? Yes. All right, come see me afterwards, but I'm gonna go through real quick. Kelvin at d1digital.com. Nikolai Ito. Sean Colbert. Judel Lopez Official. Marche2186. Bookings at kandarian.com. Cheryl Hale and WMKS21 at yahoo.com and 91mparker at gmail. Come see me afterwards. Woo! All right. If you're back there grabbing a beer, grab your beer, get your seat again, because we are getting ready to go into our very second presenter for the night. Are we good and ready to go? Okay. Can I get a warm round of applause for Bella?
This is for you, Abad. Thank you, thank you. How are you tonight? All right, so this video is going to play there and it's going to showcase what I'm talking about. I'm excited to tell you about Bella. Bella, uh, I'm the founder uh, of Bella, but Bella, let me tell you what it is. We at Bella are the specialists in the delivery of beautiful share space cinematic content. Share spaces like this that have a lot of screens, but sometimes they don't have the right content. I'm Felipe Barral, I'm the founder and CEO, and I've been telling stories on CNN with my production company all over the world and in two languages as well. Now, have you been in a hospital setting or an infusion center or a doctor's office and you have been looking at the content they have on the screens? Do you like the content? No. no. Exactly. And the reason is because it's not the right content for you. They have pretty much news on home improvement channels. None of those you care when you are stressed out about really, you know, <laughs> your health situation. So we have developed this particular solution. Now, what is that solution? a streaming service that actually provides short stories that are meaningful for you, that inspire you, that decrease the stress levels, that inspires uh, relaxation, even meditation, and that they help the, uh, the healthcare outcome for you. Now, how do we do that? Because we know the audience in those places. You're not fully committed to watch the content. You're not gonna follow a script, right? You just wanna go in and out, and that's part of the solution. Now, we have a competitive advantage. Not only we're mixing storytelling with technology in a very proprietary way, we are using what I call biophilic storytelling. And if you're not aware of what biophilic or biophilia is, I wanna tell you in a second. But before I tell you that, let me tell you a little bit of a story. I did a documentary about uh, people that live longer in the world, and these are called blue zones. And I spent a week talking to people that were more than 100 years old. And when you try to find what is really the joy of life, they tell you it's about being surrounded by loved ones, you know, the food that is organic that they eat there, you know, being in a small place, small, you know, pacing of life, but also the landscapes that they are seeing. And that is exactly what biophilia is. It's our really love for nature and connection with living things. Research already told us that when we experience something beautiful, there's a 10% more increase on the blood flow in the heart. And we feel this relief. When we see nature in real life, of course, you know, after 40 seconds, the prefrontal context of the brain that makes critical decisions shuts off and lets you be within yourself and within nature. And in those moments, you achieve the formation of more alpha waves in your brain. And that means you relax. You are not using the brain to be stressed out. And if we use that in the storytelling, we create empathy. We create intention with the content. We create relaxation. Stress levels decreases. And actually, the health benefits can be improved in the healthcare industry. Now, I use the word awe in all of this. If you go to the edge of the Grand Canyon, and you're right on the edge, you experience this sense of wonderment. That is called awe. And that is already you know, analyzed and studied. A lot of hospitals are going into the biophilic design to bring nature into these places. But if they don't have the budget to do that, the best next thing is to use the screens and to start using this content. So that's why in the go-to-market strategy, we are going to those places first specifically in the healthcare industry, to infusion centers, like chemotherapy places, dialysis, when you spend time there, worry about you. And it's not just for the people, it's also for the family or caregivers and the nurses. Now, the business um, model, actually, it's three levels of membership. They pay us to be members, and we give them three different services, and the VIP is the one more excited because we actually can create the content specifically for them. Now, we know there's already competition in the space, cables, satellite, streaming devices, even digital signage companies. We are cutting a cut in section from all of them, created a better experience, giving back control to the actual health, healthcare professionals to actually give you a better product. Now, what do we ask you tonight? We are about to launch what Bella is in the system, so if you know anybody in the healthcare industry, in the hospitals, let us know, we will talk to you so we can get and bring this product to them, because now more than ever, it's really interesting to bring beauty and truth to the world. Now, let me tell you one more thing. I'm mentioning the screens because that's what's already on the built uh, environment and these places. But Bella is not just content on the screens. We are talking about VR, AR, and any other technology we're gonna have in the future where we can develop content and deliver that content for better and meaningful experiences for you, your loved ones, and employees worldwide. So thank you, and that is what Bella is.
11 seconds to spare. <laughs> so questions? Yes. Yes, thank you for the uh, <laughs> comment. Yeah, the question is, uh, if we have an international footprint, and what is the network that we're using? Um, a lot of that footage comes from my own productions or productions that I've been involved in. Uh, I've been collecting beauty shots, what we call, you know, because every time I come from a trip, I like to hang those beauty shots. They look so pretty. So a lot of what you see is, is part of that. Uh, but the, the plan of growth, actually, if I can go into that, is actually this network of beautiful, great cinematographers that we have around the world. And also partnering with institutions like BBC, CNN, we're targeting those companies too because in my own experience, you come back from, from shows and productions and you use 10% of the footage for those beauty shots, but then you don't use that footage anymore. We can use this and repurpose it. Yes? Right, so the question is, you know, I mentioned stories and what kind of stories are these? Really, the, the first point of entry is the visual uh, aspect of it. Where you, if you think about storytelling, you know, you have the visuals, the music, and maybe the script. Uh, we know when you're in a shared space like this one, you might not have sound. So we have to grab your attention by the beauty and the cinematic look of it. If you have the ability to play with it, you can play with the sound, you can play with the, 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 the stories itself. But even the one minute stories about a place, I consider them as well as stories. You learn about places and people. Yes? Um, how, much, how much content uh, will you create so that, like, let's say you're in the hospital for a week, you're not seeing the same shit? Same, Exa exactly. Uh, how much content do we have in, in, in the network so people don't get bored by looking at the same thing? That is exactly one problem when you go to the hospitals right now. After 40 seconds or, or 30 seconds, you see the same thing looping, and it's very annoying. Uh, the idea of Bella is to have this ever-growing portfolio of content that if you spend a week, ideally you're not going to see something again unless you want to see it again and you click to play it again. Also, uh, each short story that we call Bellos, Bella, hence Bellos, not videos, it's all unique, uh, they are one minute, but we have the Bellos LP option when you can see long format of those. So if you saw that sunset, for instance, you know you can watch the entire thing if you want to, uh, or you can go deeper, deeper, deeper into the content. Yes? Do you plan to make all this content, or will you ever get to the point where you can also license the content that's available? Right. Uh, if we are creating the content or we are licensing the content, that's the question. So that's a good question because we're not a production company. Even though a lot of that content is produced by my production company, <laughs> uh, Bella is a streaming. So especially with investors we have hearing, don't be a production company because you, know, you can burn a million dollars going to Iceland to shoot beauty shit, right? <laughs> that's not the point. So we are, uh, yes, we are producing some of the content. We are partnering with creators around the world also to give them sort of the, the, the membership to provide content for us. It has to meet certain requirements, of course, and they can even use the Bella stamp of approval, that they're contributors to Bella. But like I said, we're also partnering with other production companies and channels in the world to use or repackage some of those beauty shots that they don't use in a couple of formats, let's say, for example. Yes? Yes, indeed. Uh, the question is if we're looking to partner with the hospitals. Yes, we are. Perfect. Thank you. We need to talk. <laughs> yes. That's a good question, and I didn't say that. Well, I, I think I mentioned that. Why we're looking for uh, healthcare? We know we can go to any industry that actually has screens in shared spaces. Think about airlines. Think about uh, hotels. Think about you know restaurants. Think about the Atlanta Star uh, Tech Village. You have screens here. <laughs> uh, but we, we, we feel that we have the most impact right away with people that need actually a better experience in those spaces, and that is the healthcare. And when I mentioned healthcare, like I said before, it's not just healthcare in general. We're really narrowing to infusion center first, uh, and um, you know, dialysis, chemotherapy places. Uh, we already have the, the customer discovery with those places. When we go there, and even the employees, the nurses, are like, I would like to just glimpse at that because I'm dealing with this all day long. Uh, and also in the platform as well, we have the ability for you to share it with your loved ones too. So if you're not here and your loved one is somewhere, somewhere else in a hospital, you can send them some videos as well. But then after that, we prove it there as a market. We want to go to airlines. We want to go to uh, hospitality and all of that. 
Yes. The question, can I answer the question? The question is if the, the customers you know, can choose the actual content that they see. Yes, if they are in a facility that allows you to do that, if you're in a, in a space where you cannot touch the screen, well, that's you know, what they are showing you. But the idea is that yes, you can, you can choose what you want, whether it's nature, whether it's art, whether it's you know, other type of content, you can watch it again, you can change the music, you can just listen to the natural sounds, you can interact because it's really, uh, interactive and immersive experience. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you like Bella. And thank, you for you. thank you. So, as you all may have noticed, we're in a relatively intimate space, despite being very warehousey. Please don't make me come back there and have to be the bad person and be like, "We can hear you," because if you're by the beer table, we can hear you. I'm really sorry. Please keep it down for our presenters. We really appreciate it. Um, also, you know how earlier I said we had four presenters and this was sad? I had somebody message me and say, I have a deck, I can go right now. So we will have a fifth presenter tonight, and Ed from Vim Wiki will be joining us at the end of the night. So we have a round of applause for last minute people who have their decks ready to go. So just because you show, you should send me messages. All right, so I also have some additional swag to give away. Who has number two because they are winning a highly coveted Atlanta Tech Village shirt. Who has the number two? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, perfect. Can we give her some applause, please? Congrats, Caroline. I still have swag left. Don't worry. More will be coming. Okay. Again, if you are by the beer, please do it very quietly. We appreciate you. Are we ready to go? Okay. Round of applause for our third presenters tonight, Ader Shoes. Um, hey, everyone. Good evening. My name is Pradeep, and I'm from Ader Shoes. Um, at Ader Shoes, we are basically working on a new kind of shock absorption in shoes in general. And today, I'm talking about a high heel model that we have designed and uh, developed. Before we get into details, and this is the actual shoe that we have prototyped. Um, so the problem we're trying to solve is, um, mostly women will be able to relate here, mm -hmm. high heels don't have any kind of shock absorption. They're painful, and the taller the heel, the uh, more weight is concentrated in the forefeet, which kind of adds on to the weight and usually gets painful towards the end of the day. Um, and as far as we have researched, there is no model out there in the world that basically covers this gap and provides an option for uh, to choose from. And that's what we wanted to introduce a shock absorption high heel. So this is, uh, if you generally notice, like high heels have not evolved in over like a nearly century. Back in 1920s, we still had the same concept of uh, shoes with high heels, which are pretty hard to step on. And in 2019, we still have the same. Uh, agreed, visually they look very different. The current models are much more pleasing. They look elegant, but still they're, um, I, I can assume that they're just as painful as they used to be back then. So, which is not good. <laughs> uh, so, typically like for every shoe that we wanted to cover the gap, we go through this iteration. And uh, first thing, obviously we need to create a shock absorption, but we also wanted to design a mechanism that could tackle multiple problems. One of them is the weight of uh, users themselves. So think of it like, you know, if you're a size eight and this uh, weighs 165 pounds, and someone who is size eight and 135 pounds, and you're basically using the same shoe, but your feet are, uh, you know, have to take more pressure, more uh, weight as you step on. So the amount of load uh, that you have to bear is completely different from the other person. But the shoes are not designed to account for that. They're just made in generic for everyone, uh, which, is, which is not good. So that's what we wanted to also address with our design. And particularly the high heels, uh, uh, actually in general heels for women, they come in different sizes, practically varying from like one inch to all the way up to four, five inches. So we wanted to have another uh, design which could be easily scalable um, and can be adjusted based on the height of the heel. So we use mechanical compression springs because we can have, uh, we can address all those problems. And one of the advantages of dealing with the high heel right away is we can provide more compression, which helps in actually distributing the weight a little bit better from your forefeet to the heel, 
kind of like, uh, you know, instead of concentrating on the front alone, we just use the heel going forward, which will help you reduce the pain at the end of the day. Um, and having springs used in shoes in general, we can, we can control the dimensions of the spring and calculate precisely to the weight of the user. So, you know, based on the weight, you'll be getting a specified uh, customized spring for you. So it will give you the same amount of compression, just like anybody else you would get. So, and also heels, uh, sorry, springs allows us to change the height of the heel. Like if you want to just come up with a one inch model, we'll be able to do so, just that the spring will be a little bit fatter. Otherwise the spring will be thin and long. Um, so this was one of our uh, just simple testing that we are trying to do. If you notice at the back, um, there is a regular shoe, a regular heel, which basically just stands and doesn't do anything there. Um, so if you are walking on that, basically you know, in the morning it might be fine, but as you go along towards the end of the day, it'll be like a lot of pain that you have to deal with. Uh, on the contrary, the shock absorption, you, you can notice that there is a fair amount of uh, compression in the spring, which kind of helps you adjust, I mean, uh, get the weight distributed a little bit throughout the feet. Um, so as I said, uh, so this is the shoe that we have. Um, I do have some prototypes that uh, we, we, if anybody is interested, we'll be able to test out after the uh, event is, after the pictures are complete. Uh, so if you're interested, please come to talk to me. Um, again, my name is Pradeep. I can take some questions, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, so the question is first thing, how did I get into the high heel design? So, uh, <laughs> as I initially mentioned, in general we started looking into gaps in shock absorption in shoes, and high heels was one of our second or third iteration that we want to tackle, but seemed like a good idea to start and go to market with and introduce the concept of springs and having them in uh, shoes. And it's, it was a little bit easier to produce. Second question uh, again was like if, if uh, the weight increases by like some amount, do we have to change the shoes? Uh, unfortunately, I mean, it depends on the comfort. If you're comfortable with the current spring that you have, it should be okay. But if you want to have more adequate, closer to your weight, it would always, that, that would be always better. Yes, sir. Okay, question is, are we trying to make our fashion line or are we open for licensing? Uh, we are open for everything. Uh, we are kind of getting into the market, so we do have to prove this concept out. So initially, they will be sold in through e-commerce, but we'll get there. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, question is, did we file a patent? And yes, we did. Utility. I mean, so yeah. Uh, pro uh, we, we are non-provisional, so it's, it's under review right now. Yes, ma'am. Okay, the question is, uh, will women feel like as if they're bouncing? Uh, answer is no, because the springs are not like a soft spring, they're kind of made closer to the weight of the user. For instance, this particular model works probably best for anyone under 150 pounds. So if you're anywhere between 130 and 150, you might not feel like really bouncing. We're talking about maybe half an inch of compression, which just goes on uh, by the time you just land on one feet and then move on to the next feet. So there won't be any bouncing effect, you just feel that little more softer feel on your heel. Yes, sir. Okay, so question is if the spring breaks, is there a repair process or a warranty? Uh, so we'll be able to sell the springs as an add-on, um, like in our website, so you'll be able to order more springs and then be able to replace them for you. Typically, they all come in the same head, so it's just unplugging and then putting one on the back. Yes, sir. Okay, question is, do we have female testimonials or early success stories? Uh, we just got this prototype actually last week, so we are going into talking to more women and then getting their feedback and their real-world testing. Up until now, it's only my wife who kind of hates me for doing this, but I ask her to walk a lot on this and then uh, <laughs> let me know what, what she feels about it. 
we're, we're currently in the way of doing that. Well, at the back, yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is uh, typically high heels when you walk on concrete or gravel or even grass, the heel kind of gets stuck into the ground and then it'll be kind of like a hazard. Uh, uh, compared to a traditional high heel uh, base that you have, this one has a little wider so it will help you not to get stuck as that much. Uh, unfortunately, like the more wider the base is, the better you have uh, a chance not to get stuck in the ground. Uh, we have not really tested that, but that is one of the uh, cases that we need to do test. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, okay. okay, so from design perspective, whom are we closer to? Like a high-end designer shoes or uh, more, um, you know, mid mid market. Right. So we, I personally want to look at the issues as uh, function or form. So we put little emphasis on the design itself, other than the uh, areas that it should complement the functionality. Uh, but mostly we look for the functionality itself. It has to be steady, it has to be stable and whatnot. Uh, when it comes to price point, we want to be able to be affordable for a lot of women. So we, we're targeting somewhere under 250 or even $200 to be available for market, uh, direct to consumer. If we can achieve that, that would be great. Uh, that's my primary target. We don't want to be really high end, like $600, $700 shoes. Uh, it's, there's no point if women, a lot of women cannot really afford it. Or, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, for the spring, Okay. Yeah, the question is, will the spring be exposed or will there be any kind of enclosure to hide it? Um, it is possible right now the design we wanted to kind of expose what the functionality is so people will just know what it is kind of. But as we progress, maybe we will consider having it uh, kind of like hidden inside a plastic or some other way. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Fun fact, I am gonna get a pair and try them, so I will let you know. All right, who has number three under, under their chair? Anybody, anybody? Yes, sir. I have a shirt for you as well from Headway. Thank you very much. All right, we are on our fourth of the night. I don't really want to save the skin, but I'm going to say it again. Y'all in the back, please keep it down. Don't make me come back there. I know it seems really quiet when you're back there, but it's not. I'm sorry. Okay, are we ready for our fourth presenters for the night? Let's hear it for Spotlight Social. Thank you, Allie, and thank you everyone for coming, and thank you, Johnny Honor, for sponsoring the beer. Woo! Come on. All right, guys, so I'm excited to be here, and my name is Andrew Giorgio. I'm from South Africa, and I'm a professional golfer and the founder of Spotlight Social. Now, I've been fortunate enough to travel all around the world. I've played over 400 golf courses in 16 countries and in 35 states. And there's one common problem that I see at golf courses all around the world. It's that their memberships, their revenues are down, and their memberships are declining. That's why Spot Spotlight Social was born. All right, so I'm gonna talk about Steve over here. We can see Steve likes golf. He's got it in his eye. So Steve just moves to Atlanta. Now Steve is married to Brittany and they have two adorable kids. So Steve says to Brittany, I wanna get connected and I love golf so I think let me join a golf club and I can get connected. Now on average golf clubs have 500 members so it sounds like a good plan. So Brittany says, how much is this gonna cost? And Steve says it's 500 bucks a month and she's not too pleased by that but he convinced her to say yes. Anyway, so Steve joins the club the club is excited that Steve's in town. Steve's excited. And they say, okay, well, how am I going to meet people? So they say, well, go to the driving range, meet people, show up on Saturday, see how you can get connected. Well, that doesn't work so well. A lot of us are extroverted and that does work, but a lot of us are not. 
So anyway, a year goes by, and all of a sudden, Steve has not connected to too many people. He's ended up paying a lot of money. And his wife said, so how about this, this mem membership, Steve? And uh, anyway, the club loses Steve. So what I want to do is to say, all right, how are we going to stop this problem? Here's some of the stats real quick. So the golf club memberships are decreasing by 2 or 3%, and these are from golf.com. And that's an average of 10 to 15 members per club. Now, remember Steve. Steve was paying $500 a month. That means he's worth $6,000 per year to the club. They want to keep him. They want to extend this lifetime value of a member. But this 2% and 3% ends up being about 10 to 15 people per course, which is $60,000 to the club. That is insane, guys. So these clubs have a real problem. Well, no, not anymore. I've got a, pro a product called Spotlight Social, which is connected to an dash uh, admin dashboard, which is connected to the app, and it actually serves as a CRM to an app. Not only that, but I'm gonna give you guys a little demo to see how it works. Okay. So remember Steve, Steve joins the club. Well, I'm gonna show you this page right here, and this is a live golf course. So this is a golf club called Aaronville Golf Club, and at the very top, you can see it's the custom branding of the club, and they have their own all members community. There's 155 guys in here, so I'm gonna click on that, and we go in here. The club has full access to the news, the events, the fixtures, so let's go take a look at the news. All right. You guys will be familiar. This is social networking for the private for a club. So this is very Facebooky. You can go like, comment, and share, which does not exist for the golf industry at all. So let's go back. All right, so there's a couple of events coming up. Currently, golf clubs, and a lot of organizations actually use email for their events. If you ever try to go look back in the email and try to find an event, it is terrible. Anyway, what is really nice about this, as you can see here, is this is actually my profile. I'm connected to a group called The Ringers who play on Saturday morning, who are my skill level. But you know what? You might be a beginner golfer. You might want to find a group that plays on a Friday afternoon, just nine holes. Well, at this particular golf club, at the top you'll see it says show other available communities. I want to click in there. Well, they have a coaching community. You want to get better? Take a lesson. Entrepreneurs, juniors, ladies. All of a sudden, you connected instantly. And remember Steve's wife, Brittany? Well, she can join the ladies group and she can get connected. And not only that, but she can come to the golf course on a Saturday as well and spend time at the pool and all these other nice features that golf clubs don't currently advertise. All right, let's go back to the deck real quick. This is where Caitlin's like, please work. Okay, so we are a SaaS model and our clients are the golf course owners and um, Basically, here we have 36,000 golf clubs that are in the world, and we want to target those initially. But as a golfer, I know this market well, so that's going to be easy to implement. But we realize that our product also is available to other organizations, which opens up our market hugely. We're currently in 16 organizations, and we've just launched now at the beginning of August. Super pumped by the uptake. So we're seeking $350,000 now to help us grow, and that's going to give us a seventh month, seven month runway. And in seven months, we're going to get 258 clients on the app. At $200 a month, that's a lot of money, y'all, 51,000. So we are extremely excited. And my ask right now is for anyone who's looking to invest, and we have the opportunity to find some uh, CTO. Thank you. Over here. It's an amazing question. So basically it was the demographic of a golf club at the age of 54, which is pretty accurate, how do we get them to adopt the app? Well, most of this demographic is app phobia, but actually right now, any generation that's born from uh, 35 and 40 years up is now become accustomed to the app world. So with that being said, we make the onboarding process extremely easy. It's almost an idiot's guide to download the app. Excuse the ignorance. And 
We have demo evenings at the club to help them. The Cheese and Wine Festival, we help download the app. And once you've downloaded the app, it's pretty simple. It's like WhatsApp, it's like text messaging. You go on there, you click. And the biggest thing is actually, um, they think apps are more intimidating, but apps will actually make things easier. So thank you. Right over here. Yeah, so the question is, have you considered to work with pros at golf clubs? Um, what we actually do is we try to find ambassadors within the club, people that are social. Whether it's golf pro, whether it's someone that likes to cook, someone that's a beginner. There's all different types of social communities within a club. Tennis as well. Um, so we look for ambassadors and get them to be the admins of these particular communities and help grow it that way. Yes, over here. So that's going to give us a $50,000 burn rate for the next seven months. Sorry, repeat the question. What is our current burn rate? So our current burn rate has been bootstrapped. We're on $15,000 a month. But that's majority been on the development side of things. The product is now ready to go. So now we're going to go and use the funding for market acquisition to get more clients. Thank you. Back in the left. I'm so glad you asked that. So he asked, is there a, re a market for golfers that are not part of a club? Well, there's a lot of applications out there that help you book tee times, discount tee times. Well, the golf clubs actually hate that. So they want to find out who is playing their golf course and try and convert them to members. Well, I have another company or another app called Golf Played, <laughs> which is connected to the same ecosystem. I promise so, I'm not playing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll help you out afterwards. Thank you. Over here in the back. Hey, so the membership for the club, yes. So the, the, the app is free for all users. The question was, how much does it cost for, per membership? And the, the, the organization is the one who pays for the membership. The app is free. Okay, that's for all members or? So we have different ranges. Good question. We do have a $100 package, which is up to 1,000 members. The $200 package gives you the most desired functionality. Then we have custom options for really large organizations and companies. Right here. How do you uh, plan to tackle the female demographic outside of the country and city hall? Love this question. So, I have a mom. <laughs> Repeat the question, sorry. How are we going to tackle the female demographic uh, connected to a golf club? This is actually one area which is the most, that I'm the most excited about is that. If you have an average of 500 members, the majority, the majority of these are male, but then most of them are connected to moms, females, um, uh, wives, kids, and a lot of the pro shops have a lot of good gear and they can never sell it. So what we do is we allow them to join the same communities as well as the member, and they connect, connect to the social side of things and be way more connected in the, in the club. That helps create date night and increase revenue as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. All right. I have two last shirts to give away, and then we will have our final call. But since I didn't know we had another presenter, I don't have a sticky, which means if you are interested in one of these fantastic shirts, you need to raise your hand. Who wants a shirt? Okay. I have one there. Yes, sir. I see you. Perfect. And I had a hand in the back. Somebody got real excited. Oh, okay, I've got three hands. Who really wants the shirt? Okay, she wins the shirt, she just got up. All right. Thank you very much. We're gonna do some quick uh, live demo testing with Ed. So all of you people in the back who were getting that loud getting beer before, get it now while we double check to make sure that we can make Ed's presentation work. Again, if you are a startup and you want to present up here, we typically book a month or two in advance, unless like Ed, you're ready to go at the last minute. Word of advice, you should always have your elevator pitch on you and ready to go. I do recommend that because you never know. All right, are we ready? Ed? Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming out tonight. <laughs> 
Okay, let's give a really warm welcome to Ed, who 30 minutes ago was like, yes, I can present. Welcome, Ed. Thank you all very much. My name is Ed Bolian, and I actually stood here just over three years ago, which was the week we launched the VinWiki app. And it's been a very interesting road, but uh, actually last month we passed a million dollars in total revenue. So, but what we have certainly learned in that amount of time is that the road of an early stage tech startup is never exactly what you think it's going to be. So those three years have included a lot of ups, a lot of downs, including a day where we accidentally deleted the entire app in production. <laughs> and, you know, we've learned a lot, I'd like to think. And uh, the reason this was somewhat easy is that we've been, uh, this is a slightly redacted version of a deck that I'm going to present tomorrow in San Francisco to an investment bank because we just got an unsolicited offer from a very large automotive marketing site to try to buy us. We're trying to figure out if that makes sense to do. But VinWiki is a crowdsourcing vehicle history reporting platform. So you can think of it as like a social version of Carfax. And so we allow any user to post information to any car by its VIN or by its license plate because as people who have lived our lives around cars and loved cars, we've learned that it's really hard to figure out if a used car is good and things like auto check and Carfax are preached to us as the gospel truth of cars, but in all reality, they end up being pretty useless, particularly as you get to kind of the edge case scenarios, really cheap cars or really expensive cars. And so my background has been in the exotic car world. I sold cars at Lamborghini Atlanta. I've used cars in interesting ways. I'm in fact the fastest person ever to drive a car from New York to Los Angeles. But we know that when we try to store information about our cars to curate our car's values, it's really, really hard. So we just shove stuff in the glove box, we put it in a binder, and then when we sell it, we just hand it to somebody who didn't do any of that work, and then they end up losing it. So when I was selling cars, I learned very quickly that what I could know about a car myself as a salesperson or as somebody marketing a car, that was a lot more valuable than what I could discover through the resources that existed. And so we created an interface and we launched it three years ago on iOS and on Android that allows anybody to post to any car. We could try a demo in a minute. We'll see how in the world that works, but who knows? Um, but the story matters about a car. And so VinWiki is obviously designed to be informative. It's designed to be socially engaging and it has turned out to be rather entertaining. So when we were standing here three years ago, I had no possible idea how people were gonna use it. And when you introduce a social app to the world, you think that you're just gonna tap this domino and butterflies in Kansas are about to go off and everybody's gonna use it. Well, that's not true. And so it took us about a year and we grew to about 5,000 users and the ones that we got really loved what we were doing and were really active. When I set out, I thought maybe an active VinWiki user might post once every week or a few times a month. Well, our really active users post about 100 times a day. They treat it as like an internet forum. And honestly, even to this day, I'm still not exactly sure where they find the time or why they do it. But <laughs> one thing we learned, as everybody standing up here has to, is where our users are. And it's how we market. And so the biggest thing that happened about a year in is that I was like, well, you know, we're growing kind of but we've got to figure out exactly how to market. So we started a YouTube channel and I called a bunch of friends and I got a bunch of pizza and a bunch of beer and we sat around in my warehouse and we told our best car stories. And I thought, well, this will be good. We know we've, I'd loaned my cars to other YouTubers. They'd driven them, we'd get some users. Well, it went nuts. I'd figured that if we got, I don't know, 2,000 or 3,000 views a story, that'd be great. Well, we got 800,000 views. And in the last, and last year, people spent 1,200 years watching our videos on YouTube. And in that amount of time, we've gone from 5,000 users in our app to 225,000 users in our app. And I, I, again, I don't know how, how this happens, but I have become, by a total accident, an automotive YouTuber. And so that's what I end up spending most of my time on. So we grow by about 400 new users a day from that. We've got 865,000 subscribers, 220 million YouTube views, and a database of 165 million cars. We allow users to connect cars by putting them on lists. We've got 800 million vehicle connections, and we're making money. 
So it's been a really weird thing. We have a lot of advertisers you probably don't care about. We're now about to deploy our 2.0 version of our app, and I can probably do this. So this is our app, and it allows you to, you'll see kind of a scrolling feed, and this is actually the 2.0 version we're just about to release that Mobile App Hero, locally, here at Atlanta Tech Village, helped us out with. So if you need any app things done, they're excellent. But what it works is you can post by a banner. I don't know. This seems like a cord problem to me, <laughs> if I'm being honest with you. So yeah, let's have some questions. How about that? So the questions were, does it work for just US VINs or does it work for any kind of VINs so just uh, for around the world because they use different VIN conventions? And then the question is, do we overlap that with anything that they might find on Carfax or AutoCheck? And so the first answer is that we validate VINs, which the US is really the only country that does. Most European VINs don't use check digits. And so initially we validate it and then we present it. Obviously this is a VIN that's come from somewhere else. We also do keep history of cars that are older than 1981, which was when 17 digit VINs started. And so we've got all of that. So in the 165,000 VINs that we've got, there are a lot of different ones. And so that's all worked quite well for us. And we, have, we overlay it with some web crawling data, but generally it's crowdsourced and kind of community officiated. So the VIN wiki idea is this idea that we're as a community collectively curating the story of each car. <laughs> so his question is, does all of our money come from YouTube? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so, like a lot of social apps, we think, yeah, one day we're gonna roll out a whole bunch of ads and it's gonna be a lot of money. Well, the problem is when you start selling YouTube ads, the number, we get five million impressions that I sell per month and we get about 15 million views a month. And so it's really hard for me to make it valuable for us to have you know, 500,000 or a million impressions in our app and actually value that in a way that wouldn't destroy the value of my company. And so we are an unmonetized app that uh, somehow sustains itself by being famous on the internet. <laughs> yeah, how do we work with dealers? So dealers love it because generally, as a car dealer, I was one for six years, when people say, hey, I've got this car to trade, the next words are all lies. And so <laughs> what I can learn from whatever I can discover from VinWiki is usually a more accurate representation of what the options are on the car, where it's actually been, how it's been used, and stuff like that. So dealers love it. Also, banks love it, because when they're out trying to repossess cars, they can find out where they're at. So people, have, we've actually found three different stolen Lamborghinis using the VinWiki app during the course of being live in the last three years. Yes? So the question is, let's say you're not a true dyed-in-the-wool car enthusiast. Do you actually care about our app? And inherently with any kind of resource like this, there's going to be a group of people that make the information valuable and then a consumer audience that, that finds it valuable, right? So the goal is that as we continue to overlay all the posts that are happening, as people post cars they see, cars they work on, cars they know about, cars they detail, all the things that surround the automotive hobby, all coming from like true enthusiasts, that it becomes a more valuable resource to just somebody who literally doesn't know what VIN stands for. And so that's a really, really interesting thing that we have seen is that every day people discover really, really weird things that happen to cars. 
And so, for instance, if a car is used in a crime and it's in the newspaper with the license plate visible, within five minutes, somebody's posted it to our app. And you know, so we got cars that have been repossessed from drug dealers, cars that are used in amber alerts, and I, and I eagerly await the day that somebody's like, well, I was about to go check out this car in Craigslist, but then I found out that it had been used to abduct a bunch of children, and so I decided against it and went to CarMax. So that may happen, like we, we, don't, we don't have it yet. Okay. Uh, 865,000. I get the hundred. Oh, sorry. How many YouTube subscribers do we have? I got the. You get a flag at a hundred thousand and a million. And YouTube subscription is a vanity metric that has absolutely nothing at all to do with how many views you get. Okay. Views become pretty fixed, and essentially, a subscriber is just somebody who was already watching and got reminded to click a button. And so we'll hit a million in about. We grow about a thousand a day, so it'll be sometime in November. He said the last video he saw of ours was about Justin Bieber getting a DUI in a Lamborghini. <laughs> and uh, that, that did happen. And so uh, the exotic car rental company that had loaned Justin Bieber this Lamborghini came on and talked about that car. And so they noted the VIN, and now future buyers will not have that mystery to, to solve themselves. They'll just know going into it that it's uh, been impounded by the Miami Police Department. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. <laughs> And this is why I messaged Caitlin and I was like, I have somebody who wants to last my pitch and she was like, I mean, okay. That's why you do it. All right, guys. Welcome. Thank you for coming out. Come back and see us again next month. Follow us online. Thank you all.